You're listening to Later with Mo Kelly on demand from KFI AM 640. Probably not. Probably not. KFI AM 640. It's Mo Kelly. We're live everywhere on the iHeart Radio app. The Washi Washi song in various forms is what's sung when you're on a Royal Caribbean cruise. When you're going into the wind jammer, which is the buffet portion of the ship, you'll be greeted by two or three crew members. One will usually have a guitar, the other will be just singing, and they sing the washy washy song, imploring you to wash your hands. Why? Because if you're nasty, you could spread disease to the whole freaking ship. It's kind of a big deal. And and that wasn't even there before the pandemic. That's something which is post pandemic added to ships. I'd been on a bunch of cruises that was never there until after the pandemic. Where did you find the washy washy song? Oh, you gotta love YouTube. <laughs> There's nothing better than YouTube. YouTube is 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 just glorious. Glorious. Let's go to Australia, but we can extrapolate and assume that what is happening in Australia happens everywhere else. Everywhere else. Australia's Food Safety Information Council released its latest report card on the country's hand-washing habits, or lack thereof. It found that 19% of Australians don't wash their hands every time they use the toilet. One in five. Close to half admit they don't always wash their hands before handling food. So beware if you should ever eat anything anywhere in Australia. 42%. Women do better than men at washing their hands after using the toilet. But better is relative to men that are there. Only slightly, mm, slightly better than men. 80% of men say they wash their hands every time versus 83% of women. A little better than four and five. Just 55% of men wash their hands before touching food compared to 62% of women. Again, this is Australia, but I can assume that this applies in varying levels to just about every Western country. You didn't see this in those Crocodile Dundee movies, did you? No, no, not at all. You want some E. coli? I'll show you E. coli. Ooh. <laughs> How about age? Does that, does that make a difference? Well, under 34 years old, 69% of people wash their hands every time they use the toilet. About 7 in 10 times. Under 34 years old. If you're over the age of 65... That number jumped to 86%. Maybe they've gotten sick enough times in between 34 and 65 and then started to value washing their hands uh, after using the toilet or before handling food. You know, what's interesting is Chris Little actually discovered that there is a deficit of hand washing here within our own building. Damn, Australia. Wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait. He discovered that? I he think did, we all know that. No, well, and but it was made true because many of us we see people go in, and if you go in after, you see that sink is dry as hell, then you know for a fact, <laughs> right. like that right. filthy mother father just walked out of here just hands free. I want names, but Chris no, you di- don't. Chris discovered that that the soap dispenser in in the men's restroom that has the soap is empty. hardly ever touched. Yeah, he did a study. He looked at it. And he was like, "This soap is not being used." So even if people are running here and running the water, it's look grotesque. I am one hundred percent of the time, and I'm not saying that just because I'm on the radio and I want to present myself a certain way. I am one hundred percent of the time washing my hands after using the bathroom and sanitizer at the minimum before handling food. I wash my hands and then I get a paper towel to make that sure I handle. open the open that handle. I don't go out that bathroom and touch it again because of the filthy people that I've seen walk out of there dry handed. And not only that, not only that, I, not to cast aspersion on the cleaning crew, but those bathrooms are never really clean on any meaningful level. Yeah. <laughs> 
don't want to cast aspersions, okay? I'm quite sure they're great individuals doing the best they can with what they have. But, but, <laughs> let's just leave it at that. I like that bubblegum smell of the cleanser they use. Fabuloso. Yeah. yeah that's, that's about the only thing. It's covering up everything. But apart from that, we work with a bunch of filthy animals is what you're saying. <laughs> Look, I know I've told this story before, but I'm going to tell it again. <laughs> there was a time in that bathroom that's closest to our studio, Mark, where someone. No, 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 no. They did. They no, dropped no, no, a no. turd. Uh, okay. Okay. No, I'm, I'm being serious to highlight this in the middle of the floor. Somewhere between the stall and the sink. Who does that? And Who does wait, that? Wait, wait, wait. Worse, it stayed there for days. Plural. How is that a thing? How is that possible? I have no idea. I don't know how it was done. I don't know how it remained. But it's an absolute true story. Tawala remembers it. Yeah. We all remember it. Because it's like you come in on Monday. Ooh, that's weird. That's nasty. Come in on Tuesday. That's still there. Come in on Wednesday. Damn, is anyone going to get that? Because <laughs> you think that the bathroom was going to be cleaned each night. It wasn't. I want some kind of fecal Columbo to get to the bottom of this because this is insane. I'm, I need to know who did this. Look, no, we've had someone drop a deuce in a urinal. How do you even do that? You, you back up. Boop, boop, you boop. You <laughs> what do you mean, how? <laughs> You looked in the mirror and make sure you, you know, you guide into the parking spot. And so if somebody else wanders in while you're doing that, you're just like, all I know is <laughs> high five. Someone dropped a deuce in the urinal. This is the worst thing I've ever heard. No, the worst thing is when we had a radio personality continue to drop deuces in the parking garage. Okay, that's now, the worst. Now, I have heard about that. And that's the worst. And that's just, that's certifiably insane. But I talk about all those things because in none of those instances, most likely, is anyone washing their hands? Oh, definitely not after the parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that was pre-sanitizer era. So that's why I'll, I'll give you a pound. You know, I'll fist bump you. But as far as open hand, I'm good. I'm good. You know, I'm good on all that. And all these are true. These are 100% true stories. I've heard that supposedly the women's bathroom is worse. I don't believe that. From no, what I've seen. No. Worse than what you just described? Co yes. Correct. And I only know this because my daughter came out of there one time and she was in sheer fright <laughs> because of what someone left behind on the seat. And she said, I can't go in there, Dave. Please, is there anywhere else you could tell me? She was almost in tears because she really had to go. And she would not go in their restroom because of what was left behind. And you think that we work with these individuals so we know... The person or persons who are doing this. This is indicative of some severe mental illness. You know this, right? Or some actual verifiable uh, passive aggressive evil that someone is trying to uh, put upon. It's got to be intentional uh, okay. on some level. Yeah. On and some level. Like smearing it on the White House walls Something in, like in protest. I get it. Yeah, I get yeah. it. And, and there's some people who obviously live in filth where they're okay with that. I, for me, it's just amazing that someone won't even flush the toilet. It's amazing to me. You're there. You might as well go ahead and flush it. Yeah, that's some psychological disorder. This needs to be uh, called out, reported. The person needs to be uh, put in a padded cell and charged with something. I don't care what, something. Now, going back to Australia, all those percentages that I gave you about, you know, 42% admit that they don't always wash their hands before handling food. Let's assume that people are liars by nature. So the people, if they say that 86% say that they wash their hands after using the toilet, it's probably like 64%. Because we all would like to think of ourselves as less filthy than we actually are. And people are liars, especially if someone's asking you in a survey, excuse me, sir, do you wash your hands after using the bathroom? Of course I do. Of course I do. Why would I not? That is filthy. That is in, uh, unsanitary. I'd like to thank you formally for filling me with contempt for the entire human race this evening. Oh, it's going to get worse before the night's over. It's going to get much worse. <laughs> I don't doubt that. <laughs> it's later with Mo Kelly. KFI AM 640 Live everywhere on the iHeartRadio app. You know how we talked about how the back-to-office orders and how companies, including Amazon, have been demanding employees to come back? Well, are employees coming back? And if not, what are these companies doing about it? We'll talk about that next. You're listening to Later with Mo Kelly On Demand from KFI AM 640. Oh, 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 Later with Mo Kelly on KFI AM 640. 
live everywhere on the iHeartRadio app. And we all know that life post-pandemic has been very different from the time pre-pandemic in our personal lives, especially in our professional lives. You might have noticed that there are businesses which are completely remote. There are businesses like restaurants which have retained their outside dining, which was a function of the pandemic, but they kept it even post-pandemic. And in certain ways, you can say that's a positive. But there are other businesses which have been struggling with trying to find this happy medium between allowing remote work, working off-site or working at home, and demanding employees be in the office. I'm a guy. I've been in the workforce for about mm, 40 years now. And the whole idea of remote work is still relatively new. I had a remote job with um, when I was working for Ryan Seacrest, one of his producers for American Top 40. And it required me to be very disciplined as far as structuring my time, getting things done in a timely fashion. And I understand there are many managers and many businesses which may be uncomfortable with allowing the majority of their staff spending the majority of their time outside the office. Yes, there's technology now where you can monitor keyboard movements and and the productivity of employees, but there is something to be said for office uh, camaraderie and team building. And if you're working in the same physical environment, there are pluses to that. But we've gone back and forth, and I've heard from you saying that I'm out of touch and I'm old regarding remote work. It's like, no, I don't, I don't think so. I get it, and it, it's just not for everyone. It's just not for every business. But my biggest point was if your employer says you need to be back in the office, let's say, three days a week, it's really not up for you to disagree with. Just like any other employment situation, if you're the subordinate and you have a superior, and they say you have to do this, or you have to do that, well, then that's what you have to do if you want the paycheck, because that's the agreement. You are hired to perform certain services. You're hired to perform and produce. We usually work in these results-based businesses, and if you aren't producing, and if you're not following the code of conduct or the expectations set forth by your employer, I am okay with your employer firing you. But here is the rub. It seems that despite these stories that we've read, that we talked about, how companies like Amazon have been demanding, and Disney, for example, have been demanding their employees be in the office at least three days a week, there has not been a measurable shift in policies. In other words, the demands have been made, but they have not been enforced. And this is according to real estate brokerage CBRE. That quote, about 80% of organizations have put in place return to office policies, but only about 17% of those organizations actively enforce their policies. Four out of five have put these policies out there and only maybe a little less than one in five actually enforce that. Now, you can look at that one of two ways. You can say that they're laying the groundwork for later firing these individuals who are not adhering to the policy or they're just lax altogether and afraid of upsetting employees and losing talent or some combination of both. But it's really fascinating to me that in this workforce environment that employees seemingly have more power than they justifiably should have. Now, I know not all jobs, not all industries are comparable. There are some jobs you don't have any flexibility to work outside of an actual office environment. Like, for example, Stefan, I'm just going to pick on him. He doesn't have a job which has even the real flexibility to not be here because a lot of times he has to problem solve in a physical environment from computer, audio. He physically needs to be here. Now, the, there are capabilities in place where a lot of this he can do off-site, but it's essential for him to physically be here. That's why he couldn't necessarily come to the July 4th remote at Chateau Le Mo because he physically needed to be here. Also with Mark Rahner, he needed to physically be here to deliver the news. Now, there are some things that he can do remote, but to best do his job, and that's the main point, 
you needed to be in the physical studio. Even though when we do the the the, the later with Mo Kelly pre Halloween soiree, there is a technical aspect to be able to allow him to go up to the party and do the news upstairs in the helpful Honda studios. I think the technical aspect will be to have a fill-in anchor down here in the news booth. <laughs> no, you're doing to, the news. To do the news. Uh, you're doing the news, surgeon. Do you remember what it was like during uh, that thing at the White House last year where I was sitting right next to you scrambling to put together news reports in the middle of that crowd while you, we were also trying to do a show? Yeah, it's going to be just like that, except worse. <laughs> well, you know how to throw a party, don't you? <laughs> oh, yes. It's going to be great. You'll love it. Okay. But we, in this environment, yeah, there are times where I might be able to do the show from my home studio, but it's not optimal. It's a way it can be done on occasion, but my boss has made it very clear. Hey, Mo, we need you in studio. It helps for the overall presentation of the show. We like to see each other. Yeah, and there is something to be said for line of sight when doing a radio show. Oh, and you can tell uh, a lot of the times when somebody's remote, we talk over each other because uh, we can't really see the cues, whether it's, you know, the hand raising, which we actually don't do that much of. Uh, but, you know, you can just tell in a normal conversation when you've established a rapport and a rhythm with somebody how that's going to work. Yeah, I can see you right now. And I know that you are attentive and not necessarily doing the newscast, preparing the newscast. But if I'm remote, I can't see you and have to say, hey, Mark, if you can hear me or if you're in the news booth or whatever, there's a disconnect. Yeah, I've got my face all scrunched up like a chimp when I'm focusing on some other work and can't really engage you. And you can see that right now. Yeah. But our boss says, hey, we need you to be in the studio. Some is just without a question can't be done elsewhere and also it helps for the overall product but as far as normal civilians with regular old adult jobs go don't you think a lot of this boils down to real estate money of course of course and, and, and i would think jobs if, if they want excuse me employers if they would like to save money on rent and office space if you can you would let more of your employees work remotely but it's a case by case basis. Uh, uh, like, for example, with even iHeartMedia, there are fewer people in the office now post pandemic than there are pre pandemic. Most of our sales staff is not physically in the office all that often. Uh, that's not a big secret, but you know, these jobs have evolved. But there are some companies which have said we haven't evolved that much bring your ass back to the office yeah we're having a big cultural and professional realignment now and some of the push pull involves the money if you challenge the money the money's going to push back yeah, and then it comes down to who is more important who is more replaceable or irreplaceable got some bad news for you well you know that's a game that i never want to play nope because i know i'm imminently replaceable and just about everyone in all of their jobs Varying levels or degrees are replaceable as well. Do you want to play that game with your employer? I wouldn't say it's an employee labor market right about now. I would not say that. The first newspaper job I ever had, there were screens around the building. And one of the aphorisms on the screen every day said, the graveyard is filled with indispensable people. Message received. <laughs> <laughs> I had not heard that. I'll have to remember it. It's later with Mo Kelly. KFI AM 640. We're live everywhere on the iHeartRadio app. And did you hear about the extraterrestrial gave its first TV interview this week? Well, yeah. Well, <laughs> we're going to play it for you. You're listening to Later with Mo Kelly on demand from KFI AM 640. And at the risk of scooping George Norrie and stepping on his toes... There is this audio we need to talk about. Allegedly, an alien has given its first TV interview. Daryl Anka, 73 years old, claims he challenged channels an otherworldly entity named Bashar. And Bashar is not only an alien, Bashar is from the future. After a few seconds of twitching and shaking, Daryl transforms into Bashar, taking on an entirely different personality. Sounds like maybe he's possessed or something like that. So it's an alien and also from the future. Correct. Mm -hmm. Pick one, man. No, it no. could be both. Because he's an alien, has powers that we don't, and is from the future. Highly plausible. According to this, Bashar likes to talk to us 
to help mankind's evolution. So Bashar is talking to the past in the hopes of improving or quickening our evolutionary process. Daryl, the guy who's channeling Bashar, he was interviewed by documentary uh, maker Serena DC, who last year probed the existence of alien mummies in Peru. And I know you're saying, Mo, just get to the audio. Okay. Well, let me just say this. I firmly believe in the existence of other species, intelligent life beyond this earth. I don't believe that this is one of them. Okay? I might be wrong. I might be. But I don't know that this is the proof that we're looking for or will be hearing. Nonetheless, let's give it a go. We're finally here. Here we are. I have to tell you, it's been such an incredible journey. And I want to thank you so much for letting me into your life. Oh, my pleasure. Daryl, and getting to know you. <laughs> it's been a rabbit hole already. This is Daryl, not the alien. But Daryl's getting ready to channel Bashar already and now <laughs> we're about to have well i'm about to have an interview with an extraterrestrial this is a momentous occasion so. no it isn't no it isn't but sure you know you it's been a rabbit hole already and now <laughs> we're about to have well i'm about to have an interview with an extraterrestrial this is a momentous occasion so i just want to say thank you before we get started Wait, are those birds in the background are they outside? Enough of the mockery. The extraterrestrial. This is a momentous occasion. So I just want to say thank you before we get started. My pleasure. You'll never know how much this, this means to me. Oh, I appreciate the opportunity <laughs> to allow him to share his message. Mm. So well, Thank you. Shall I let him come through? <laughs> yes. <All> yes. Right. <laughs> Give me just a minute. <clears throat> and then... I'll say goodbye. <laughs> See you later. See you on the flip. Yes. All right. <clears throat> All right, clear your throat. Lick your lips. Inhale. I'm going to say good day to you this day of your time. How are you? <sighs> Hi. This is, Bashar, this is Bashar from the future and another planet. Okay, this interviewer is a little too giggly. You never heard Mike Wallace <laughs> giggle like that, okay? Uh, yeah, show some respect for the interviewee. This is serious. Okay, here we go. I'm going to say good day to you this day of your time. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you, Michelle? Perfect, thank you. Please, by all means, you may proceed however you wish, but allow us to thank you for the co-creation of this opportunity to exchange ideas and information with you. Okay, I'm not sold. I'm not believing it. It sounds like Daryl. It does not. Okay. That literally sounds like two different people. Okay, this is Daryl from the beginning. Here we are. I have to tell you, it's been such an incredible journey. Your life. Oh, my pleasure. Daryl. And okay, that's Daryl. Here's the alien. I'm going to say good day to you this day of your time. How are you? <sighs> Hi. The birds didn't react any differently. They didn't feel a presence. They don't look. The birds don't understand what's happening unless the birds are also aliens. But that is a different dialect altogether. <laughs> okay. So it's maybe Eddie Murphy doing different voices. I, mean, I, I don't get how that's a, an alien from the future. And I want to believe I am the audience for this. How do we not know? Just cause, just cause Because we can't prove a negative. Okay. I can't prove that it's not an alien, but there's nothing compelling in that. Okay? Wouldn't you want this uh, happy alien that we're introduced to, Bashar, who's, who sounds friendly and wants to explain and help guide us? If Bashar, Why Bashar? If Bashar can channel Daryl from the past and a different civilization, Bashar can do something a little bit more compelling and also revealing and speak to someone other than this woman who has a podcast that I've never heard of. Why can't you speak to someone like someone credible like Brett Bear? No, because Brett Bear is a doubter. Brett Bear is a doubter, Mo. Tucker Carlson, then. Tucker Carlson is a doubter, too, even though Tucker Carlson's audience is dwindling and could possibly use someone like Daryl Bashar to come on and revitalize his ex podcast whatever the hell it is he's doing yes okay elon musk he would be a good person because that's one alien talking to another does the alien speak russian 
Look at the tie. <laughs> oh, no, that's a good day to you this day of your... No, that's English. <laughs> oh, no, that's a good day to you this day of your... <laughs> Sounds like an auctioneer. <laughs> you know, you're so oh, cynical. Oh, that's a good day to you this day of your... Next, you're going to be tell me uh, that Jerry Lewis didn't really turn into Buddy Love in The Nutty Professor. Oh, that's a like good day to you this day of your... Dog. No, I, I wouldn't say that. He turned into Buddy Love. It was him. He turns into Buddy Love. Uh, let's hear it one more time. Oh, that's a good day to you this day of your time. I got to you one of the best times. Oh, that's a good day to you this day of your time. Look, when I expected us to meet aliens, <laughs> maybe my expectations were just a little too high. Maybe I just wanted it too much. It's a pretty flamboyant. Oh, that's a like good day to you this day of your time. The flamboyant alien there. Hi, <laughs> I'm good. How are you, Michelle? Perfect, thank you. <clears throat> Please. By all means, you may proceed however you wish, but allow us to thank you for the co-creation of this opportunity to exchange ideas and information with you. Okay, this is just garden variety schizophrenia. Let's not make it more than it is. Oh, now you're stigmatizing mental health issues. No, nice work. No, Daryl does need help. I'm just saying he's just oh, not from great, another. Mo. Okay. He's just not from another dimension or planet That's that all. we know of. Stop bashing Bashir. Bashar, get it right. Bashar. <laughs> He's not Muslim. Mark, wait, what is his name? <laughs> Bashar. Uh, yeah. Daryl and Bashar. Daryl so and Bashar. A, it's that uh, British journalist, uh, Andrew Bashir. Oh, that looks like a day to you. No, that's Martin. Whatever. <laughs> oh, that looks like a day to you this day of your time. KFI AM640, we're live everywhere on the. Oh, that looks like a day to you this day of your time. iHeartRadio app. You're listening to Later with Mo Kelly on demand from KFI AM640 news has just come in that former Dodgers star Fernando Valenzuela has passed away today at the age of 63. If you had been following the team, you knew that he left his broadcast duties early in the playoffs and it was noted that he would not return for the rest of the season. If you had seen pictures of him recently, he was very gaunt. He had lost a lot of weight. Although no public statement had been made specifically as to what he was dealing with in a health sense. It was clear that it was seeming more dire than not. And if you know anything about Dodgers history and Fernando mania of 1981 and how he was a very integral part of that 1981 team, which won the world series against the New York Yankees, the irony should not be lost on any Dodgers fan as we get ready to start this next World Series. But just without uh, Fernando Valenzuela as a broadcast figure or Dodger legend who would be present to take part in it. And this news is just breaking. I know that AM570 LA Sports, our partner station, had just posted the information. The LA Times has just posted this information. Um, Fernando Valenzuela is survived by his life, wife, Linda, and four children, seven grandchildren, and extended family. The Dodgers retired Valenzuela's jersey, his number 34, back in 2023, last year. And this was done despite a long-standing rule that the team only did so for those who were in the Baseball Hall of Fame. Valenzuela was not elected to the baseball MLB Hall of Fame, but he is still one of the most legendary Dodgers and Dodger personalities in history. If you weren't old enough or if you didn't live in Los Angeles during 1981, Fernando Mania, when he started out 8-0, and that time in Dodger baseball history was unprecedented. I know it's a word which is used far too often and most times undeservedly, but that time truly was unprecedented. We're talking about a time prior to social media when, and actually at the advent of cable, but yet Fernando was everywhere. He was as big a celebrity as the Lakers in terms of sports celebritum. He was so big and uh, so beloved at that time. And if you look at the evolution of the Dodgers organization, if you want to talk about Los Doyers and how Latinos and Spanish-speaking people 
fell in love with the Dodgers, and I say this with great respect, and hopefully I'm getting this right. It was in large part to Fernando Mania and how Los Angeles embraced Fernando Valenzuela and how the Dodgers embraced Fernando and his he was he was a, a, a different type player. If you just looked at him, you think this guy could not be a major league player. He he was pudgy, he had a little bit of a gut, he had this weird throw. He threw a screwball, which just about nobody threw in the sport of baseball. And if you think, well, what's a screwball? It's it's like a reverse curveball. Uh, a a curveball, you're spinning your hand outward. And a screwball, you're spinning your hand inward. And the curve goes in a different direction. And it confounded major league batters all over the place. They just didn't know what to do with it. And he did not throw with great velocity. I would say he was in the high 80s, low 90s. But he still was a very, very effective pitcher. Um, He did eventually throw a a no-hitter. And he is probably one of the greatest Dodgers in the latter portion of the 20th century. As far as of all the great Dodgers who have always um, uh, left us with great memories on and off the diamond, you can't tell the Dodgers story of the late 20th century and not include Fernando Valenzuela because he was one of the the pitchers and players instrumental in defeating the Yankees and breaking that Yankees curse in 1981. And I'm quite sure the Dodgers will do something special in remembrance of him probably before the first game on Friday. The timing of this is, of course, ironic. It is sad. But if you had been following the story and watching at least the public pictures of Fernando Valenzuela, we still haven't gotten a specific cause of death, but he had been in declining health for quite some time. This is a very sad day for any true Dodger fan because Fernando Valenzuela was huge when it came to Dodger history, Dodger lore, and also Dodger success. So if you're just tuning in and you don't know, Dodger legend Fernando Valenzuela passed away today at the age of 63. He will definitely be missed. It's later with Mo Kelly, KFI AM 640. We are live everywhere on the iHeartRadio app. Well, at least you've decided to listen to KFI. See, you're making progress. KFI. And KOST HD2. Los Angeles, Orange County. Live.